example, jQuery template mechanism. With the template support in Web Components, you may not have to use jQuery template, but when we get to the template discussion, then we can um, uh, talk more about that. The Web Components are natively available in some browsers. Some here means Chrome. Okay. Um, it is, it's, uh, partially it is also available in uh, Firefox, yeah. but it's, the support is not very good. But I'm gonna show you how to enable that in Firefox real quick, okay? Um, so here, you will go to About Config, okay? You have seen this message before. Um, so here, this is a configuration. This is like a registry for your uh, Firefox browser, okay? And here, you're gonna search for Web Components. And then you can see, uh, when I did the talk in the morning, I uh, set it to true. By default, the web components are disabled. They're not enabled, okay? So you have to just double click to change the state of that. But I warn you, only a few things are gonna work. So yeah, you can try it, but uh, it's not gonna be very helpful to run all the examples that I'm gonna discuss today. They will all work in Chrome, however, okay? Yeah, yes, sir. We're good already. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so you know, uh, how many people know what the concept of polyfills? Polyfills, very, very, yeah, it's very, very common, right? So when a framework support is not available in the browser, you have these fallback plans in the form of polyfills. What you do is you take existing JavaScript objects from the browser, you extend them, and then now you have ex additional support, right? For web components, a framework called Polymer already exists that allows you to use web components, right? Um, but then you're gonna ask yourself that is it really worth using Polymer or any other polyfill framework, you know, for just the syntax uh, um, uh, compatibility when things could change drastically going forward. And when, what I mean by that is you will see when I showed you the signature of some of the methods, you can easily tell that those signatures could change very, very uh, easily. Um, so when the support is very widely available for the web components, then maybe you want to have Polymer so that some of the older browsers still have the capability. But at this moment, if you want to go all you know full-fledged web components in production, probably not a greatest of the ideas. Right? But you want to understand how to prepare yourself to build these components going forward. If you have release coming in next six months, you want to prepare yourself. So what do we mean by enhancing the semantics for the application? You know, I tell you this, uh, the, let's say you have a web page where you render a, uh, a user, their name, uh, their biography, their credentials, and so forth. There's some metadata about the user is presented, but all of those tags where the metadata or the content is created, uh, is uh, provided, is going to be div, right? most likely div. Uh, because it's a block element, it can have your know, new line before and after, so you re generate your data using some of these block elements like div or span when you don't want to have new line characters. But when the search engine optimizer comes into your web page, it takes a look, it says div, okay, div, okay, div, right? So search engine has to understand and infer what is the intent of that content, right? It cannot understand by looking at div because everything else is also div. So what if we were able to name our elements properly that, hey, this is the user bio, this is the user's uh, credential, this is the user something else, right? Then it will be easier for the search engine optimizer to read the content from your web page. And that's what custom elements will allow us to do. And they're not just uh, custom you know, tags. Like when you heard about HTML5 three, four years ago, um, one of the first you know, promising thing was that you can create your own tags. And using CSS, you can match the tag name and then make a display block. That means you, know, you can use it as a div. Right? And add some more properties to it. But this is more than that. Here, you will be able to not only, sure, change the, the CSS for those tags, but also will be able to change the states of the element and its substructure. For example, when the element gets element gets added to the DOM, you'll be able to capture that event. When the element gets removed from the DOM, you'll be able to capture that event. And when the attribute changes on, the, on that element, you'll be able to intercept that as well. And that you can today do with the, the browser tools, right? You can go to the DOM. Let me show you uh, what I mean here in a second. So let's say we are in Chrome here. Um, so here you can right click on one of the any element, you can say hey break on, and then you can select like when do I break, when attribute gets changed, and then you can specify the value there in the breakpoints. But um, what I want to show you is a little more enhanced than that. that. That means you can control all of this behavior through the code itself when you're creating the custom element. Um, so let's go back to the, well, we'll come back to that screen in a second. Okay. Um, okay. 
So yeah, so four things we're going to talk about, as I mentioned earlier, custom elements, the templates, as well as HTML imports, and then Shadow DOM, which may be useful to you, may not be useful to you at all, even when it is released in many different browsers. Okay, uh, Custom elements increase the readability. That means you don't have to call everything a div, and you can call them as proper name of that content. The only thing that the framework asks you to do is add a dash in the name of the custom element. And the reason for that is that if later on W3C adds a new uh, element, the custom element that you created earlier should not clash with their element. That means they will not add a dash in their element name. So that's why the only requirement here is the strict requirement. You have to have a dash in the custom element you create. Okay. I already talked about the semantics of the search engine optimizers, and the script changes uh, changes means that for I, I talked a little bit about that too that you can intercept when state changes on that particular element. And the good thing about these custom elements is that you can extend from an existing set of elements from the HTML DOM, which means you want to create a new button, but you want to use the capabilities of an existing button uh, element, but you want to add some more properties, add some more styling, you can also do that. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at the demo quick, quickly. Um, okay. So first thing what we want to do is we want to create an element which will be a prototype of HTML element. This is a prototypical inheritance, right? That means I'm creating an element which will be of type um, HTML element. Here I could also have HTML button element, text tree element, and so forth. Right? I'm going to create a very simple element here. And the prototype is uh, in the variable name proto. And you can see these four different callbacks that we have instantiated. Don't have to read inside, but just take a look at the names of these. Created callback, attached callback, attached, and attribute. Everything is a callback anyways. I don't know why they have the word callback in them, right? Isn't that implied? So that's what I meant by, you know, these signatures might change in the future. Don't be surprised. And, you know, when you look at attached and detached, that would remind you of uh, attached event and detached event from a very famous browser. Right? What browser is that? IE. Right? Um, old IEs had this mechanism of attaching the event. But now what you do is you use add event listener and to move even listen, right? So you don't use attach event and detach event uh, nowadays. Okay. So created callback gets triggered when you instantiate or register or create a new custom element, okay? So it's very different than actually adding it back into the DOM. So attach callback is gonna be called when you take an element that you created and you put it on the DOM, okay? So that'll be triggered then. And then we have the control on making changes to our uh, DOM. So what we're doing here is, Let's say this custom element only had some inner text or some text content ABC. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to take the, uh, the, this instance will be created when the custom element is actually put on the DOM, right? And then it's inner HTML. We're going to put some custom um, a markup here and then the original content that was already in that element. So we're going to do that. It's a very simple test here, right? And then when we remove this element from the DOM, then we're going to call we're just going to log into the console that, hey, this was removed from the DOM. Um, now, the thing that comes with these elements is that they also have attributes, which means if I add a new attribute, do I need to monitor that change? And what do I do, right? And then in that case, I have some events like uh, attribute change callback. I get the name of the attribute and then old and the new values, and I'm also just instrumenting that. Um, now, once we have uh, initialized the proto uh, prototype object, we have to register this element to the DOM. And this is something new that you might not have done before if you have not used web components, that you register, it's like, a, you know, you create an element using document or create element, you know, you know fragment, you know, text, text node and so forth. Similarly, you have a register element now. You give the name here, as I mentioned earlier, it has to be the one that contains a dash sign, okay? And then you specify the prototype for this, which is actually the type of this particular custom element we are creating, the type is going to be proto, and this one could have also been another existing HTML element type, right? which we, we did not use, we just used a generic HTML element. In addition to that, you can also specify that, um, that this um, element extends from an existing element. So you can say extends HTML button uh, element, right? Even even at uh, even this point. And also you can add some more properties or methods to this custom element um, if you're interested. Now we have just created and registered this element. What we now want to do is we want to add it to the DOM, right? There are two ways to add to the DOM. One is very simple. You just say, hey, cust L, and then you add some text to it. You don't have to. You can add some other uh, markup as well. 
And by just doing that, it's going to, um, you know, when it's added to the DOM, it's going to intercept that call here in attached callback, and then we're going to come here and log something in the lo uh, console, and then we're going to add our own markup as well. And the other way to do it is very simple that I mentioned earlier, you can use docnode create element. You create the type of cust dash el, and we just add a simple uh, text in it, um, and then add it to the body um, as this element. For this, because we're creating a script scriptable element, we're also trying to add a new attribute to this custom element. The, the name of the attribute is at, and the value is new value, right? So now let's take a look, and we'll come back to this last statement in a second. Um, so this statement is basically very simple. It's just to show you that when you remove an element from the DOM, what happens, right? So I added a five second timer that it will remove uh, after five seconds from the DOM. So we go back to the browser here. Okay. So you can see that uh, the first element I added, the cust el, and then this was a custom content we had inserted while the, uh, the element was added on the DOM. And then we also have added another one, which is removed now because there was a five second timer that kicked already. So if I go to console, I can see that custl is created, and then it was added to the DOM. Then another one was created, which was added to the DOM as well, and then we just set an attribute to it, and after five seconds, we removed it from the DOM, right? So this is what uh, you, you can intercept here. And you can see that the value was first originally null, which means the attribute wasn't there, so that's why it's null, to new value is the new text that we added in this attribute. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's uh, basically a simple uh, custom element. The real power of custom uh, custom elements comes in when you add them um, uh, in conjunction with the, the templates, right? We'll talk about templates next. Okay. Any questions so far on the uh, on these? Okay. Yeah, let me know if you have any any questions uh, at any time. Um, okay, so. So you have used templating frameworks, right? You have used handlebars, mustache, you know, jQuery template, a whole bunch of them exist already. And why do you use them? Because you want to define the structure of your markup, and then you want to replace some of the elements in it with the real data, right? Or you want to extend that and add some new real data to your template, and then you want to put that inside the DOM. That's the idea here, right? And similar idea is implemented by the Web Components template tag. So this is a new element called template. But the, the difference between this template element and other elements is that it only will download the markup, but will not parse the markup, right? Until you actually you know, want to instantiate that template and add the content out of that into your DOM, it will do nothing. It will just be markups. It means simple text that will transfer from the server. Yeah? Um, and you know you can do that by putting that template inside a custom element, or you can just put the template tag as is on your web page. Either ways, it will not be parsed. Okay. Um, and you can create multiple instances of the template. And you know now what example I'm going to show you is we're going to create a very simple um, a table. And by default, the table will exist with just a header. And then there's a template that only has markup of a table row. And then we are going to you know, inject some data into the table row and add that as a child of the table. Okay. Um, so let's take a look at that real quick. So here we can see first, there's a table. The ID is employees. And it just has one uh, row. And that has just you know, ID and name. Okay. Our idea is we're going to get some JSON from the server. In my example, I just have the JSON already on the web page. Um, but you're going to get some real dynamic data from somewhere and then replace these zeros and ones with the real data. Right? I just added this zero and one with curly braces just so that you know it's a placeholder. But this is not a, a standard. You can have your own standard. You don't have to even put the DDs. If you know what the structure is, you can just instantiate it as a simple scriptable element and add new rows as you want. But uh, it's a simpler example, so I'm going to show you how to read this row and replace the 0 and 1 with the real data. Okay? And that real data will be ID and the name that we will receive from this JSON. <coughs> so very similar to previous example, we have created a prototype of HTML element. Um, the created callback doesn't do anything. It just logs the stuff. In the attached callback, um, what we're trying to do is, uh, we, okay, let me first uh, go down here. Uh, I will come back to that one. 
Let's first take a look at when we registered this custom element uh, called emp dash data. Okay, and the prototype for that one was uh, proto, as we mentioned earlier. So cust el has been added, uh, has been registered, and now we create a new element of this cust uh, of employee data, and we want to add it to the DOM. Right, that's our idea. But we're also adding a new attribute to it called data. And you don't have to add the attribute data here. I just wanted to show you that when attribute gets added, what happens. And this is simple JSON. And then you can use, uh, um, you know, you can set the property of this uh, uh, EL object directly, or you can get the JSON from the server and keep it in the cache and then use it. It's totally up to you. But a simple example I showed so that when you uh, um, add this particular element to the DOM, then we can retrieve data field from it, get this JSON, parse it, and then basically instantiate the template and render new rows inside that table. So now we'll go to this attach callback method. It's a, it's a very simple method, really. The first thing we can do is we get the data attribute. And you can uh, blame me for this evil call here. Um, you should use json.parse, but uh, you know, it's a rough JSON has single quotes. You're supposed to use double quotes. That's why JSON parse, parse was failing. So I just replaced it with eval because I didn't have enough time. But in general, you will use JSON parse or JSON 2.parse method. Right? You already know that. Um, so after that, what we do is um, we get the employee, uh, which is basically the table that we have. Um, and you can take a look at this t uh, sorry template that we have. And this template is right over here. Um, what we want to do with this employee is we want, this is a very important uh, statement to remember when you're working with templates in HTML5 web components. You import this node from the content of this template, and then you mark true. True means it will be a deep copy. That means everything that's inside also will be copied and uh, uh, imported along with the content of at the higher level. Right, so now you got the clone. Now in this clone, what we have is some TRs. How many TRs we have in this clone? One, hey, because uh, we just have one TR. Two is the TD. <laughs> I should have sh kept that on the screen before asking. Um, yeah, so just one TR. So what we want to do is we want to take the zero from it and one, and then just replace it. Very simple. So we got this uh, data already parsed. We go through the data, and what we have is um, let me show you the data as well, so that you know what uh, we're talking about here. So it's very simple, right? So the first element has this ID, and the name is A, you know, and, and so forth, right? So similar, it's very, very simple. Just ID and name properties. So we go through that, we replace zero with the ID, one with the name, and then we create a new element, TR, and then we replace this row's inner HTML um, uh, with the, we, the replaced variable that we just created. Okay, and this is not any standard approach. This is just my simple way of you know replacing some um, placeholders with real data. But you're going to use your own approach, whatever you uh, use in other frameworks as well. Anything will work. Basically, just uh, text processing at this point, right? So now, once we have this new row created, we're going to take the table that we had instantiated. We're just going to put this row in that table, right? So three rows will be added to this new table. So that's what we saw here. So if you look at here. Um, you go to the elements, you go to this table, you got new three new rows added, and you can see the uh, the content is just uh, you know the ID and then the text, right? Um, so very simple approach. Now, you know you can extend it in many different ways, uh, however you want, but you just you know now you know how the basic fundamental of that is. The real important thing to remember is that it will not render or, or parse this content which is in TR, it'll just keep it as simple placeholder. But un when you do import node, then it, the parsing will occur, okay? Okay, so now this was uh, the templates example. So let's talk about something that is actually very, very useful construct in new web components, uh, um, and that is HTML imports, right? So how do you add your CSS file to your document? You have all done that, right? You use link rel is equal to style sheet, href is blah, blah. And how do you add new JavaScript to the, the document? You use script tag, do that, right? It's very simple. And you get creative by using a sync, and you also get creative by instantiating a scriptable element called script, and then you say, hey, dot .src is equal to some script address, and then you can monitor its on ready state change to actually add it to the DOM, right? So that you can asynchronously download many scripts. Um, and why I'm saying that uh, about asynchronous? Uh, because by default, if you put a script tag, second and third script tag, 
what will happen? Will they uh, synchronously download and everything will be instantiated parallelly? It'll, it will not, right? Because it will block the call. It will block the next script call till the first script call has finished because it might need the objects that were instantiated in the first script, right? That's the idea. But, uh, but what we want to do is to add new markup, you know, HTML document into your existing new document. You don't have a way to do that today without web components, right? So how do you do that these days? You just go to your server side, you create a user control in ASP.NET or whatever other framework you're using on the server side, and then you render it, boom, from the server. You have your headers, you have your sidebar, your menu, your footer, everything is a control, right? What if you did not have to create all of that stuff? What if you could just use something that is on, available on the client side? Um, and um, some people might think that, hey, it's, it kind of sounds like an iframe, right? There where you can just add an iframe, and then you can put a web page content in there, and then you know it'll just render. What is the downside of uh, iframes in general? Do you guys use them? <laughs> I'll be surprised if you use them still. Um, yeah, some people use them because they have to when they are rendering ads and stuff like that on their web pages because there is, you know, common agreed upon standard to use frames. Where we can when they can talk into frame uh, only for the ad scenarios. You don't use iframes as much because iframes are blocking calls. And even let's say you have three iframes on your page, you just added with the same page content. Do you think it's gonna get that content from cache for the second and third iframe? If you have three iframes, same web page. It may not. Okay, it does not understand that. And then if you're using a server-side technology like ASP.NET, ASP.NET has this web page life cycle. You know, you get uh, in it, you load, you pre-render, you render, and so forth. Each time you put anything inside an iframe, it's gonna come through the whole life cycle. Okay. So it's usually very slow and not very, very recommended to use iframes. Now, the idea that I'm trying to uh, talk about here is about the HTML imports. Very similar, but you're not creating another document object model. You're modifying the existing document object model with some new content in it, okay? And then that content, after you've added the import, you can actually programmatically talk to it, yeah? So let's take a look at, at that. It's, again, a link tag, the way you have used style sheets, very similar. Uh, the different thing is import. Instead of saying style sheet, now you're going to say import, right? And then href. Here, um, you're going to specify the path of the, the page that you want to load. Um, there is a catch, and that catch is uh, that you have to, okay, before we talk about that, how do you talk to uh, other websites when you want to make an XML HTTP uh, request call or AJAX call, right? So how do you do that when you have to go to a different uh, service altogether? Let's say you, you build microservices all around and they're deployed in different servers. Um, from one page, what is the mechanism to go to another website? Can you just say that, hey, now we go to HTTP abc.com slash blah? Yeah, well, how do you fix it? Course, right? Yeah, very good. So you all know course, right? So cross-origin resource sharing is required here as well. And on the server where the the resource you want to retrieve, there you have to configure access control allow origin to the site that is going to make the call to this particular web resource, right? If you're in a good mood, you can just say access control allow origin star, right? Which, <laughs> which it should not, right? Um, because then everybody can call and then uh, 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 do the DDoS attack on your website. Um, so anyway, so the, the HTML imports require you to configure course, just a very simple thing I wanted to lay it out there, uh, which also means you cannot run examples like these from uh, a desktop where you can just open an HTML file and then you know include some content. It won't work, right? Because you need to have the HTTP access. You have to be on a web server. Um, yeah, so this, uh, the good thing it provides us is, uh, because we want to know when the, uh, the downloading of a particular resource has finished, so we can do just onload, very old fashioned way of you know knowing when your content has been loaded, and if it errors out for any reason, then another you know, interceptor will be called. Um, so I will, when I render it, I'll show you that you know, it'll just display the href of this target that uh, we downloaded. Uh, there is a problem that I mentioned earlier that they are blocking calls. They are going to block your um, um, rendering, right? But they're not going to block parsing, though. Which means that if you have, let's say, three uh, link realistically import calls, all of them could be parsed 
um, right? And they will not be rendered all of them at the same time, right? You see what I'm saying, right? The rendering cost and then parsing cost. Different things, you spend mo both of them when you're rendering, web web making web application. But there is a way around it. The way around that is you just add a sync attribute here. Have you guys used a sync attribute uh, in, uh, um, in script tag? Yeah. So what is the ad I, uh, is advantage of a sync tag is very clear, right? That your scripts will not block uh, downloading, but there is a disadvantage as well. The disadvantage is that if you have a second and a third script, which is relying on something from the first script, if it downloads before, it's not gonna have that variable that it's looking for, it's going to give you runtime error. So that's why uh, uh, downloading asynchronously all the scripts, you have to be really careful. Uh, you have to check for the variables, whether they're existing or not. Right, so this is one uh, way of uh, importing the content. And let's uh, see how it renders on this page. So you can see that it, uh, we have an interceptor that says loaded content from you know the hrefs, uh, the ta targets href, which was this web page. And then it had a custom element, which has been now rendered here. Right, but the, the beauty is this, right, that it actually will show you the, um, yeah, and of course it's also removed because of that timer. But you, once we render it, you will see that your DOM gets modified, um, right? and then you don't have to basically, you know, deal with these frames. That right? you cannot inter uh, frame uh, communicate very freely. Okay, so that's that was our import. Um, it's very useful because you know uh, um, one thing I will add is that um, when you have used a particular H HTML file as HTML5 uh, as import HTML import. Um, the second time you use it, it will be from the cache, cache of the browser. That means it won't actually go into the server and then download everything again. So, which is, you, you may argue, hey, even the images work like that. But yes, but there is a functionality. Even for the actual imports, you get the same content from the browser's cache. Okay. Um, okay, so let's see what else we have here. So imports I talked about, you know, you, you can, uh, um, I already discussed all these points, and you will have access to this uh, deck if you want to refer to later on, you can do that. Um, so the shadow DOM, um, kind of, yeah, some people think it's a very, very useful thing, you know, what is the real use case of that, you know, you will know in a second, uh, but um, the idea here is this, that you create a custom element, and you put a lot of complex markup in it. Let's say your organization is divided in this structure. You have a server-side developer, you have a, a JavaScript developer, JavaScripter, whatever, and then you have this UX designer. And the the job of the UX designer is not the the you, yeah they we call them diviner in in my previous company, but you know they they're not really designers, but you know they also are writing some markup. So they write the markup for you, but they don't want to uh, you know write this complex markup. They want to provide the custom element, a simple element that, hey, this is going to be user's biography tag, that's all. And this is the content inside. And this one, you can replace with your real uh, world uh, server call. To make their life simpler, you can uh, you know hide all that complexity behind the custom element. And in fact, even hide it. And when you see the DOM inside the browser's uh, development tools, you don't even have to show all of that inner elements. You can just hide them. And when I show you an example, you'll be a little surprised if you have not seen the shadow DOM before, that all these HTML5 elements like a, a you know, slider, video tag, audio, they actually have a lot of markups inside. And let's take a look at that. But you don't see that markup unless you do something uh, special. Okay, so in this uh, thing, I'm going to, okay, let's take a look at this one. So let's take a simplest of examples and add input type is equal to range. It's going to add a slider on our web page, yes? Okay. Okay, let me also quickly see one more thing. Sorry, the resolution is. Let me close it actually. Okay, so. So, by default, actually, what I wanted to open was a setting that says 
this I close it by default you will see the content like this so if I say inspect this element you see it's just input type is the range right there's nothing in it you cannot see anything in it but what if you go inside the settings and say hey show me the user agents shadow DOM and now you can see what's inside behind the picture it's all devs again right? devs are not leaving you um, so what does that mean the framework when they created this input type is equal to range they did not want you to see that because it's not very useful to you all it's useful to you is the events they have created on top of that range and simple markup that you have and you can always style that with simple CSS as well right so we want to hide this sort of complexity from the people that are adding these tags on the web page okay and to add this shadow root for your own custom elements is also very very easy to do so what we do is we create a shadow root and then put it in some variable name and now any new markup that we want to add inside our custom element you can add that inside this shadow right? that means you can just basically yeah this is security for my viewer here um, now if I go and see my custom element you can see there is a shadow root automatically created I did not create something called hash shadow root right? I just created programmatically a shadow root element which means anything underneath that is actually hidden um, you know from uh, the user yeah so this is the idea basically you you want to redistribute your controls but you don't want the user who is using your controls to be bamboozled by all this you know custom markup inside and you should when you go back you know try to put video tag and then take a look at the depth of the video tags internal HTML that you don't usually see okay um, it's very very uh, robust oh yeah yeah sure so if you go here yeah, this is, yeah, it's not very friendly uh, thing. But again, you know, this is Google UI, so. Um, yeah, so it's, it's right here. Sh show user agent shadow down. Got it. Thank you. All right. Um, yep. That was that. And then let's see. Um, I think that's all the primary content I had. Um, but we can discuss more things, right? Do you guys think shadow root, shadow down will be useful to you? Um, for some people, it will be useful if you're redistributing controls. Um, but otherwise, you know, you, you may not find it very useful. But yes, to uh, reduce the cognitive overload on the user who is trying to debug the markup, um, you know, it's good for them. And there's another advantage. If you go into, let's, let me show you another exam uh, example. You know that, right? You can take any element, and then you can, um, you know, try to do some, um, you know, you can add a new attribute here or you know you add some styles you can change some styles within the rendered page you already know that why do we do that because we want to do all the testing right here before we have put this code into the real you know sort of code behind right node.js or whatever you're using ASP.NET C sharp so you do all this uh, work here and then you say oh yeah, yeah these uh, combinations work for me and then you can set them from the code behind right so but if you only see the shadow root then only you can do that uh, if you don't see it, then you don't, won't be able to debug or diagnose the problem with your markup. Yeah? For example, you know, what am I seeing here? Like, the font weight is bold because I use a strong tag, right? Um, so this is shown uh, me, to me here, and I can add more properties here, remove this property, and, you know, and still see what happens afterwards. Uh, let me see here. <coughs> Yes, and, uh, and wherever I'm getting the new uh, the styles being applied to my elements, I can also see them here. And then, uh, you know, I can also hide and show some new elements or new properties that I want. So you can do some debugging with your markup over here, and then you can hide it and then, you know, package it basically. Yeah. Okay, so that was um, uh, primary uh, things I had to talk about, but I'm, uh, you know, open to uh, you know, taking any questions. Yeah. I I would love to see performance issues if they work in other browsers. You know, if they don't work in the other browser, that's the problem. <laughs> I, I I I can show you. Look here. Let's let's go here, and you will see very simple thing will not work. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. HTML. Okay. So this one is working, but let's take a look at. Uh,
okay so this is working that's good <laughs> um, let's take a look at the templates oh that's great actually wow I didn't know that now it is compatible actually it's rendering just fine in uh, this uh, uh, developer edition good <laughs> thank you <laughs> uh, you know I have not used a polyfill uh, but I, I, I am almost very sure that the polyfill will add performance concern because polyfills are written in JavaScript right and then the natively these uh, controls are not necessarily created in JavaScript itself um, but I will do that experiment and let you know uh, I haven't done that performance benchmark between uh, the polymer versus the native web components but I will do that for sure okay yeah, I have no idea on that one because you know I could um, even when you follow the W3C spec, you know you might think that is all complete and everything should be compatible, right? Uh, everything should be now supported by the browsers. Mm -hmm. But I worked in a company that built a web browser, and I can tell you that it is not that easy to just be, you know, take all the features that are coming in and you know just make it compliant. It's uh, it's a lot of work, and coordinating to have the same kind of uh, you know signature, the syntax is also another problem. As you can see, that uh, attach callback, detach callback. I don't think that is going to be the final uh, signature. Yeah, person. Yeah, yeah. It does. It looks like very clunky because everything is a callback, anyways. Then why do you have to say callback? Right. So you can think about it. But I. Um, I don't know. I think this will be a good question for the, you know, the MDN, the, for the Mozilla Developers Network, and you know, um, uh, because I have never even tested this thing in, uh, uh, in IEs, so I don't know <laughs> when it's going to be. It's very exciting, but you know, you yeah, know, you hold your <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. It's very promising technology, um, but yes, the, to have full flight support will take some time. Uh, yes, le let me come back to that. Um, so I really like my and something that occurs to me is like. At some point, these can be used as some kind of like plugin, and mm -hmm. so I've been trying to write them in terms of like being as flexible as possible and as customizable as possible, so that I can like maybe recycle it later. Mm -hmm. It's something that I run into is like styling is a is a big issue. Like I style it very specifically for the use case right now. Yeah. And I've been trying to figure out like the best way to go about maybe like externalizing the uh -huh. styling. Okay. I haven't really figured out a way to do that. I'm just curious if you Okay. Uh, you know, it's interesting that in the morning also had a similar question about styling. How do you package styles for the custom element? Do you package them within the custom markup or do you use ex external file? But when you do that, what happens is anything that's after your custom element also gets those styles. The real question here is that the custom for the custom element, I might have the same classes class names or IDs that I have used for other elements on the page. Right? This raises a problem that um, you could have the same IDs, you know, because you're recycling these objects, right? In server-side programming, ASP.NET, for example, handles that scenario for you. It won't, won't let you create two elements with the same ID, for example, right? But when you, you use this approach of recycling these elements, you might run into these clashes, and whichever element is coming after, they are going to, you know, uh, uh, you know, rule, right? Because so this is a problem actually. I don't know how what the solution is. I have run into the same problem that you have. <laughs> okay. Yes, you had a question. Yeah. Um, how does shadow roots work in a responsive design website? Um. Just apply the CSS rules to like the, the root level element. Yes. Yes. It's a related question. So the question here is that how do the styling, how does styling work on the responsive uh, design? You said the uh, on the shadow root, right? On the shadow DOM. Uh, so you know the the thing is that you can package your uh, styling within that custom element it will work just fine but the problem is that how do you get rid of that styling information when you come out of the shadow root i don't know the answer to that um, you know i would like to know answer if somebody has actually <laughs> as well yeah, because the problem is that it doesn't just contain within um, uh, in that uh, shadow root but i would like to find out as well i'll let you know if you I find it. Oh, do you have the access yeah, 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 you have X. So you, can do you can do conditioning as well, but how, wh how do you deal with the scenario where your custom element is used in multiple places and it has some IDs as well in it? And if you use the same element twice, the ID will be the same, right? 
unless you actually modify those IDs programmatically as well and keep them dynamic. Then you won't run into those issues. Uh, but there are some real issues there. But uh, I'm sure we can address those issues, and you know, once that is done, uh, we don't have to use a lot of lot of framework. You know, my my friends and I joke about it all the time that the days without a JavaScript framework, uh, one. Yeah, that means every day, you know, there's a new <laughs> JavaScript framework that we see. Uh, we don't want to, uh, you know, uh, do that. And a lot of developers, the new developers I hire, they complain about that. They are saying that uh, we work with this framework, but we don't know anything outside of this framework. We don't necessarily know how JavaScript uh, works behind the scenes because we're only using some you know, upper level frameworks. Right? People want to understand, uh, my guidance always to the new de developers is understand how the JavaScript actually works. Then you can use the you know, frameworks on top and in fact enhance those frameworks as well. And always take a look at the memory leaks that are happening, take a look at how much time you're spending on painting, rendering, and loading and initializing. And then you can enhance your application. I'm a big proponent of uh, responsive uh, applications. But it's uh, with using the external frameworks, or you know, even the polyfills like Polymer, you don't have control on enhancing your application. With the web components, you know if you have made a mistake, you can fix them, right? Well, how do those polyfills account for um, the CSS sandboxing? Uh, how does that account? Uh, the question is, how does that account for CSS sandboxing? Yeah, if you create a shadow down the line. Mm -hmm. CSS of it. Mm -hmm. sandboxed. I don't think it is sandbox. That is my concern uh, because uh, you know I think she had uh, had similar question. If it was sandbox, we would be great, right? Then we don't have to worry about any. We just create any custom thing that we want, push it in there, and then in fact uh, the CSS as well as the the IDs of all the elements we've created, if they were all somehow unique within that instance, will be great. But I think it's not that way. Yes. Um, okay. Um, but it does seem to do limit, limit Oh, it does? Okay. Okay, that's great. Yeah, the, the, the question is about, uh, you know, the, or the comment actually is uh, yeah, there's a scoping uh, capability available within a CSS that could limit the scope of the styling. That'll be great, actually. I have not done that, so I cannot uh, comment on it, but, uh, but it's good to know that it is all success. Okay. <coughs> Any more questions or? Well, there's no questions, I guess. I'll just join the discussion. Yeah. So if you had a, a class, for example, like to the parent element, like, I mean, you can access all the elements just using, you know, like, sh uh, shout off or stuff like that. Isn't that a way to scope, to create a scope? You put a class on the parent element and then access everything throughout that thing, so. It does. The problem is that um, whichever the latest class definition was is going to be used. Right? Yeah. Which means that if you had a same class definition above and all the elements are using it, now you come to another element, you create another uh, CSS, yeah. same class name, everything after that is going to use a new one. So that's yeah. the issue there. I mean, that is what we... People using the same class. Yeah. Using right, but, but he made a comment about, you know, that there is a way to probably scope it. That means it only will be applicable to a certain set of elements. That will be great, right? Yeah, that class with 150 <laughs> Yeah, yeah that's, that'll be, uh, yeah, I think that I'm going to go back and take a look at that problem. I, I have heard from three different people today, and it's a good problem to solve, actually, yeah. Right, thank you, man. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. Oh. Appreciate it. All right, I'm going to stop you mind if I take a picture of you just for my collection of <laughs> yeah, speeches? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Yeah, so this page, there are resources. Um, I already tweeted the link to the deck, and uh, the code examples are over there. Uh, some uh, useful tutorials are in this page, okay?